Hello to our webinar attendees this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on Providing Comforting Touch to Very Preterm Infants Using the M Technique. We're so pleased to have Joan Smith and Sandy Connor join us as our faculty presenters this morning. Dr. Joan Smith has nearly three decades of neonatal nursing experience. She currently holds a joint appointment at St. Louis Children's Hospital and Goldfarb School of Nursing in St. Louis as an advanced practice clinical scientist. Her combined research and clinical experiences have focused on integration of neurodevelopmental care interventions for at-risk infants and their families in the NICU. Most recently, she has focused on implementation science related to clinical decision support tools for therapeutic hypothermia and the safety and suitability of the M technique. Sandy Connor is a physical therapist supervisor at St. Louis Children's Hospital in the NICU. She is designated as a developmental care specialist by the National Association of Neonatal Nursing. She serves as co-chair of the Developmental Care Committee at St. Louis Children's and the subcommittees for kangaroo care, positioning, and infant massage. She is a member of the National Association of Neonatal Therapists and serves on the NANT Collaborative Board. Sandy is certified in lymphedema management, premature infant massage, and the M technique. So welcome, Joan and Sandy, and Sandy's going to start us off today. Hello, this is Sandy. Um, we have nothing to disclose. So when uh, Joan first started doing her research, um, we looked at clinical questions like wondering, um, do you routinely offer comforting touch, massage, gentle human touch, acupressure, etc.? If yes, who provides this comforting touch? Do you routinely offer this touch to infants born less than 30 weeks gestation? And at what postmenstrual age do you begin integrating comforting touch routinely into your practice? Do you have restrictions or do you have a specific protocol? So we know that more than 80,000 very preterm infants born less than 30 weeks gestation are born annually and very preterm infants are at risk for significant cognitive impairments, behavioral problems, social and emotional adaptation, poor executive function, a wide variety of learning disabilities, and increased need for special school services. <clears throat> and the environmental impact is extremely important, important on these infants, which is why the synactive theory is an important framework for this research. It's about decreasing stress by altering the infant's micro and macro environments based on each infant's physiological and behavioral responses. And the synactive theory is a foundation for developmental care. You can see by this slide that we know there's exponential brain growth that occurs between that 25 weeks and term. And you can see that by this slide here. And stress caused by maternal separation, pain, isolation, sleep deprivation, and other environmental events activate the HPA, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And constant stress becomes toxic, which disrupts brain architecture, stress relate, causes stress-related disease and cognitive impairment. And we know that stress can increase caloric expenditure, and prolonged stress increases the risk of cognitive function, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and mental health challenges. Developmental trauma is really a traumatic, traumatic event that occurs during sensitive and critical growth period. And the caregiver regulates the infant's stress response. If it's safe, secure, loving, it cultivates resilience. And we know that simple care precipitates major fluctuations in cerebral hemodynamics, which can be associated with parenchymal brain injury and long-term developmental outcomes. HPA axis dysfunction, which is chronic stress, can cause insulin resistance, autoimmune diagnoses of the gut, regular alterations in brain structure and function, and growth failure. And GE reflux represents one of the most important manifestations to stress exposure to the GI tract. So this slide here shows these were all 25-week 
uh, gestational age infants at term with a similar medical course. And you can see by looking at the slide, the difference in the brain structure, especially in the sensory motor regions of the brain. If you <coughs> go back to the basic science of the autonomic nervous system, um, we know that controls visceral function. So your heart rate, respiratory rate, digestion, breathing, and swallowing. And the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight. The blood flow goes to the skeletal muscles and lungs, dilates alveolar oxygen exchange. You get increased heart rate, vasodilatation of the coronary vessels, and blood flow away from the, uh, from the GI inhibiting peristalsis. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is the calming of the nerves, the return to regular function and enhancement of digestion, causing dilation of the blood vessels to the GI and accelerating peristalsis. So when you think of our kids who are in stress, obviously the sympathetic nervous system is kicking in and we want to promote more of the parasympathetic nervous system of the calming. The infant signals that you see, the approach signals, are smiling, cooing, quiet and alert, relaxed limbs, smooth movements, soft, face, relaxed facial expressions. And I often will look at the fingers to see the relaxed um, finger flexion. Whereas when the infant is starting to <clears throat> exhibit signs that they're not sure of what's going on around them, you'll start to see them either suck, you may see hand or foot clasping, fisting, grasping, bracing body part against the crib, hand to mouth or face, going into a drowsy or light sleep, and or a tremor or twitch. And the avoidance signals are actual changes in the heart rate or respiratory rate or color, whimper-like sounds, finger splay, saluting, which is spreading of the fingers, thrusting the legs out straight, or sitting on air, which is straight up in the air, grimace of the forehead, eye floating or looking away, arching, gasping, or yawning, hiccuping, spitting up, or gagging. So the goals really in all of our interactions in the NICU is to promote autonomic and behavioral stability and to modify our handling in response to the baby's cues. So ideally is to provide containment and boundaries in all our interactions, including position changes and transfers. And anytime you're doing any uh, massage or comforting touch is to slow down, stop or provide containment during interventions if you start to see any of the stress signs. So when Joan initially started doing her research, she did a review of literature on massage and <clears throat> found several uh, cited research studies that showed the benefits of regular infant massage being weight gain, decreased pain, improved digestion, decreased hospital lengths of stay, decreased stress, which is obviously the goal, and improve neurological, motor, and behavioral development. But what she found was gaps in the literature. There was, no, uh, there was kind of a conceptual ambiguity when you say the word massage. There was no clear operational definition, and there were varying protocols. Um, most of the studies were on healthy preterm infants greater than 32 weeks postmenstrual age, and some of the studies included position changes and, and a kinesthetic component, which our babies are the preterm, very preterm infants may not tolerate. So it wasn't our population of interest. And the, we wanted to look at the hospitalized, very preterm infants to see their tolerance. So Joan did an integrative review um, called the comforting touch in very preterm hospitalized infant. And in looking at it, found that most of the touch that very preterm infants receive in the NICU is associated with medical nursing procedures, which results in adverse effects like hypoxia, bradycardia, sleep disturbance, and increased intracranial pressure. 
um, which resulted in many minimal STEM policies. Um, comforting touch is looking at stress reducing supplemental touch to promote relaxation and that's what we wanted to look at there were but there were very few studies on the very preterm infant there were two infant massage studies gentle human touch which i'll define at the next slide tactic therapy which is touch and caressing tender and caring therapeutic touch and there were 11 total studies on the less than 30 week PCA and less than 31 weeks at postmenstrual age. The massage studies, some had with, some are with and some are without kinesthetic activity and some with unimodal and some with multi multimodal, so an additional stimulation like uh, music. <clears throat> then therapeutic touch, which is really a non-touch energy balancing therapy. There was a study on acupressure and meridian massage at that age, which is Eastern vital energy therapy. The gentle human touch, which is a still touch without stroke or massage, which we call containment. There was a study, a yaksin, which is a Korean touch with some caressing, and a tactic, which is touch and caressing, tender and caring, which consisted of gentle light stroking and caressing. The M technique <clears throat> is a relaxation technique, which is very systematic. So it's the same pressure, the same strokes, and the same sequence, uh, which is important for research purposes. And it was ideal for patients too fragile to tolerate a traditional massage. It's easy to learn, reproducible, and can be used for a lifetime. So the structure is, is that each movement is done in a distinctive pattern that's never modified based on cues. So there's really for the back, for instance, there was eight particular strokes. And you'll see a video in a minute that shows three of the strokes. For instance, a, a D, we call the D stroke, a B stroke, and a diamond stroke that you'll see. <clears throat> each time you do it, you do three of each stroke. And the theory is that the first time you pay attention to the stroke, the second time you recognize it, and the third stroke, you begin to relax. And the pressure of the M technique is a three on a scale of zero to 10. So zero would be no pressure. And if you just on your forearm right now, just with your fingers lightly, uh, just do a downward stroke, you can see the one or two would be like a light tickle, which can be aversive to that po our population. And then adding a little more pressure to that, where you're actually getting a little bit of indentation of the skin is the, the level of the three. And it's very slow, constant, rhythmical stroke. Now the evidence, current evidence on the M techniques um, is do was done in met multiple settings and populations. So it was done on dementia patients and found to reduce stress and increase well-being. It was done in a hospice setting, which showed reduced terminal agitation, anxiety, stress, and increased relaxation. Uh, it was done in the PICU setting, which there were mixed results in decreasing pain symptoms and improving oxygenation infants post-cranial facial surgery. The um, late preterm infant, it was shown to decrease pain and improve oxygenation post-circumcisions. And in the healthy preterm infant, it was shown to decrease pain and improve physiological parameters. And now, um, Kathy, if you can pull up the video, please.
Hi, this is Joan. Thank you for inviting me to be able to talk to you. It's an honor to be here, and I'm just going to talk you through the process that we went through. Uh, there was a group of us that were interested in learning about this. I had was in working on my doctoral um, studies at the time and connected with uh, Dr. Linda Frank at UCSF. And she is actually the one that told me about the MTech to meet technique. And so while it sounded good to many of us, um, we were still highly skeptical. So we wanted to see what we could do to um, bring it here and, and see what it would be like for ourselves. So um, we got a small grant and were able to bring Jane Buckle, who is the actual developer of the M technique, in from England. And she met with a group of us. As you can see, we all learned the strokes. And she spent several days with us teaching us not only the baby technique, but also adults as well. And so that was probably one of our best decisions was that we were able to um, experience ourselves. And so it, um, it let us know how at least we felt, not that we could put that uh, directly on the infants, but at least it gave us an area from which we could um, start. So um, we wanted to go ahead and see, is this even a potential that we could do in our babies who historically have been known to be very sensitive to much of the stimulation that we give in the NICU? But we need, we know that they need to have pos some kind of positive um, touch. Specifically, we know that Kangaroo Care is a great um, multimodo um, approach that they can have as well. Um, but what could we do that could potentially decrease their stress and improve relaxation? So we were very interested to see if this is something that we could use in our population. So we wanted to just look at one time, you know, was it even feasible? If we even attempted this on these babies, would they completely not um, like it at all? Would they respond negatively? What would their response be? We clearly didn't know. So we wanted to go ahead and just test the feasibility. Could we even do it? So that's what we started with. So we wanted to explore the application of the M technique and hospitalize very preterm infants in our level for NICU. And we wanted to determine the impact of the technique on physiologic, behavioral, and state responses in very preterm infants. And we measured it on 10 very preterm infants at 30 weeks post-menstrual age. So they were born less than 30 weeks, and we wouldn't start it on them until they were 30 weeks post-menstrual age. And our design was just whether or not it was a feasibility observational intervention study. So we wanted, again, our inclusion criteria, infants born less than 30 weeks and who did not have any major evidence of brain injury, specifically a grade four interventricular hemorrhage. And um, they were excluded if they clearly didn't have intact skin, if they were in a septic shock, if they had respiratory failure, which at that point was defined as an FiO2 greater than 75%, if they had severe brain injury, or if they had persistent tachycardia, persistent bradycardia, or those deemed unstable as determined by the attending physician and the medical team. So we wanted to look at physiologic parameters, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations. We wanted to look at behavioral variables, so their stress and relaxation cues. And we used the um, one to look at their behavioral states. And so we looked at the, and used the Anderson behavioral state scale. And so basically we've, what we found was that the babies tolerated it well and um, it actually decreased their heart rate and it um, improved their um, states over time and demonstrated that, it, um, that they had decreased stress and relaxation. And this is just a visual so that people could actually see. So from baseline to 10 minutes after we gave the technique, you could see that the blue, sign, the blue line indicates that over time, the positive cues increased and the negative cues decreased over time. Again, that was just one very small study. Uh, we, again, we wanted just to make sure that they could actually tolerate it before we proceeded. So as a team, we got together. And I just want to say, um, Sandy was gracious to say in Joan's study, but actually this study was done by a full interdisciplinary team that 
everybody's input was so valued and so appreciated. Um, and we had physical therapists, occupational therapists. We had a cell physiologist. We had Terry Ender, who was our um, neurodevelopmental expert, and as well as Jackie McGrath. And so um, it couldn't have been done without a full team. So the next thing we wanted to do was say, okay, well, could we actually do this using a randomized control trial and deliver it over five weeks? So it's one thing to say that we could give it once just to see what happened, but what if we did it um, over time and over a five-week period of time? Could we even do it, first of all? And if we could, what would the effects of that be? So our research time designed for this, again, this time it was a pilot study, and this time we were basically just saying, could we do this if we were to take it to a next larger level scaled study? And so for this, we had 10 very preterm infants who were born between 26 and 30 weeks gestational age and who received the M technique, um, and then they were matched to 10 control infants for gestational age, race, and gender. And then uh, the purpose was to systematically test the cumulative effect of the M technique on infant neural development in hospitalized pre very preterm infants over a five-week period. So the specific aim, one, was to investigate the neural behavioral and growth velocity impact of the M technique for hospitalized very preterm infants. And our hypothesis for that was that the very preterm infants who receive the M technique intervention will have improved neurobehavioral development using the NICU network neurobehavioral scale or the NNS. And then we would also look at growth velocity. So their birth weight and infant weight at the beginning at the end of the protocol compared to the control group. And then our next aim was um, to investigate the physiologic and behavioral state impact of the M technique for hospitalized very preterm infants. And our hypothesis for that was very, very preterm infants who receive them technique intervention will have improved physiologic stability over time and behavioral state changes from baseline at three different time points over the course of the five weeks. And this particular aim was directed towards the intervention group only because they were the actually ones that were receiving it. We did not have, we had a control group, but we didn't compare whether or not they it would have just been um, randomly looking at their vital signs or their states during any course of time that was not controlled for. So this was basically our conceptual model is that the deleterious effects of the environment, the biological makeup of the infant, the genetic and the epigenetic makeup of the infant all come together, and what we were trying to do was modify the environment by providing an end technique or a relaxation intervention over a five-week period, and specifically looking at NNS um, scores, so the neural behavior and growth velocity impact, as well as specific physiologic and behavioral state impacts as well. So um, our setting is a large level four NICU, and it is an academic center. And um, very preterm infants greater than or equal to 26 and less than 30 weeks gestational age were randomly assigned to the experimental or control groups and 30 weeks postmenstrual age at time of commencing the intervention. So again, similar criteria to our feasibility study and making sure they were babies that were born anywhere between 26 and 30 weeks postmenstrual or gestation and then they were 30 weeks once we delivered the intervention itself. And then we followed a very detailed protocol that um, we had established through our feasibility study. The feasibility study is great for those who are actually um, looking for something, an easy way to get involved in research or to look at a specific practice intervention because it allowed us to say, oh, what we thought was gonna work didn't work, we need to change this, we need to modify that. So it's a really nice first way just to start. And then um, because we did that part of it, we did have a pretty good detailed protocol to follow. And then the infants received the M technique six times a week, no closer than six hour intervals for five weeks. So for they received actually a 30 um, applications of the M technique 
that were delivered by trained personnel. And the two people that delivered the M technique for this study were me and another nurse practitioner. Both of us um, have extensive years of experience in working in the NICU, um, 30 plus years, and also um, with dealing with babies specifically related to um, neural development. And again, the methods we used were the NICU Network Neural Behavioral Scale, and we measured that at the end of the five-week intervention. And then the physiologic and behavioral states were also um, measured as well over time. So this is just a um, this is just a little, hopefully not too confusing to look at, but this is just a little flow diagram just showing that when the babies were admitted at what particular age, um, the ones that came into the to their unit and then the ones we excluded and the reasons for exclusions and then the ones that were randomized and how we randomize. Uh, when I go through the results for you, instead of having 10 and 10, we actually had nine um, and nine because there was one infant who had expired before we started the um, intervention itself. So this is just a, um, a table showing that the characteristics you can see in the M -tech Greek technique group as far as birth weight is concerned. The mean birth weight for the babies in the M technique group was 970 compared to the control group of 932, so there was virtually no difference. Gestational age was actually very close as well. Their APCAR score at one minute and for the M technique group was 3.9 versus 4.2 in the control group. And then you can see we looked at acuity scoring. Um, and then you can see the gender as far as male and females were pretty much equal and as well as um, uh, black and white as far as our race. Um, and that's how they divide it up. So very close to being equal in the two groups. And then this is just a descriptive variable table as well, just showing that uh, the majority of infants were either on high humidity nasal cannula, CPAP, CIPAP, CIPAP, and one baby in the control group was originally on a ventilator. And then most of them did have some type of supplemental oxygen. And we had in our unit at this time, we had two um, patient room designs. One is an open pod and the other one is a single room design. And for the most part, that it was equal in those two groups as well. And the majority of the babies were on caffeine that received, not surprising considering the gestational age. So this is our results. We looked at the, um, the NNNS. And what we found here is there's some degree towards um, having some maybe significance, but there really was not a significance. So we can't say that the M technique had a big neurobehavioral significance. Um, what we can say compared to the studies that are out there that look at uh, neurobehavior for babies that are born very preterm is that the scores were similar to those. And we feel that. Um, because we did the testing on the early age of um, postmenstrual age, so as soon as they were finished with the M technique over that five week period, they were closer to 35 to 36 weeks um, postmenstrual post age. And at that time is when we tried to get the NNS done and did get it done. Um, but because of that, many of the published reports, the actual test was done on the babies when they're closer to term equivalent, so closer to 40. Um, we were concerned that we would lose them to follow up once we got discharged, and so um, we did not wait until 40 weeks, but feel that if, if um, this were to continue, we could have maybe seen a difference. But as of this time with this report, we did not see a difference in their neurobehavior um, testing. Then we looked at weight. And so the infant's weight between the two groups, although you, there is no difference between, you can see the control group, um, the, it was 1171, and the main group, uh, the, I'm sorry, the control group was 1158, and the M technique group was 1171 to start. And then at the end, the, um, the M technique group was 2335 and 2107. 
those numbers at the at their weight at 35 weeks postmenstrual age were not significantly different between the two numbers. However, the growth velocity, so the amount of weight they gained from 30 to 35 was significantly different at a, um, at a P level of 0 0.005 in the group that did receive the M technique intervention. And then this is also a slide that we put together. It's actually a line graph showing the experimental subjects that received the M technique from baseline to um, 10 minutes post the intervention. And you can, so this is basically all the subjects, their mean heart rate over time. So at the, um, on the Y axis is the heart rate and on the X axis is the time points and at baseline, but if you can see, because I know it gets confusing just to look at, but the black line that goes all the way throughout is basically a mean of all of those numbers together. And it's just to show you that from baseline to the end, 10 minutes post the intervention, their heart rate did increase. And then this is one that just shows them from each time. Um, so at 30 weeks gestation, this is their heart rate went from a mean of 170 down to a mean of about 154. And then at 32 weeks, their heart rate was a little bit higher to start with, so 174 down to a mean of about 156. And then um, their heart rate at baseline at 34 weeks was actually higher. So you can see this actually represented what it was like for us to go in and deliver the intervention as the babies matured they were more awake by the time we went in to do the intervention. And um, I don't know if I made this clear or not, but the intervention, we never woke up a baby to do the intervention. The baby was in a awake state prior to giving the intervention. And so as you can see over time, their heart rate actually shows you that, that you know they were active and moving around as they're older, the gestational got, but they still, you could see, responded to the intervention over time. And then this is their respiratory rate. So this is similar over time. You can see the respiratory rate um, actually is kind of all over the place, but for the most part, it did decrease over time as the intervention was delivered at 30 weeks, 32, and 34 weeks. And then this one is kind of the reverse of what we just saw in the other two. So the um, this is the oxygen saturation, so we delivered the intervention, and then you can see over time, both at 30, 32, and 34 weeks, the oxygen saturations increasing as well. And then this is the Anderson Behavioral State Scale, and um, for any of you who are not familiar with the scale, it's a 12-category scale, and it basically measures their state over time. So looking at anywhere from a quiet sleep all the way up to awake and fully and hard crying is the, is the higher number. And so um, the Anderson Behavioral State Scale scoring is on the y-axis, and you can see the higher the number, the more um, you know, crying or, or um, awake that they are, and the lower number, the more they're in a quiet or, or a sleep state. And so you can see, again, this makes sense. So at 30 weeks gestation, their alert and crying is not as much as they are when they're 34. Um, and so, again, the point here is that as we gave the intervention over time and through 10 minutes post the intervention, their sleep, they went to more of a quiet and relaxed sleep state. So basically, um, this is one of the first studies to support the cumulative effect of this infant-driven technique, and um, it incorporated a series of stroking, so it was more than just gentle human touch, but I will say that it was very much in tune to the baby's um, behavioral and physiologic cues. Um, we used a specific set pressure, we used a set sequence, and it was um, repetitive. 
and um, specifically again for babies that were born very preterm and who um, and it was delivered over a five week period. And it also demonstrated the utility and feasibility that it could be done and potentially have a positive physiologic and behavioral stack state impact um, and have immediate um, positive reactions, even though there was no um, neurobehavioral um, differences shown in this particular study. So like any other research, the, um, there are benefits, but there's also <laughs> a lot of limitations, and although I didn't list all the limitations, I do want to make it very clear that this is a small sample size. It's one unit, and so its generalizability is limited. Um, we did not take into account, into account um, babies who had alterations in brain function, so they, who may have had already had um, MRI findings that um, would have shown that they'd had some type of um, neurologic impact. And um, we did not look at, again, long-term outcomes. So once the baby came home and did some NIS scoring on babies after when they were closer to a year or two, and we did not take into account the perinatal factors that could possibly affect neurobehavioral outcomes, such as antenatal steroids. Um, in saying that, hope is that the randomization of the trial helped eliminate that. And again, the NNS was done at one point in time. So we had a trained observer. She is a PhD OT who is um, who does many of these um, evaluations. And um, but again, it's one point in time. So if a baby was not feeling well that day, um, it doesn't can take into ex to that into account. And um, the person that did the NNS scoring actually was blinded to whether or not the baby had received the M technique. But the, ab the examiner who actually scored and observed while we were doing it clearly wasn't because she was right there recording. Um, so that is also a, could be a potential bias. So future research for doing um, the M technique is to do larger, randomized, systematically, systematically designed studies and to see if we can show specifically any long-term effects um, that it relates to, as it relates to brain growth, long-term neurobehavioral development, decreased stress. Um, clearly, 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 this is an intervention that um, I feel strongly that parents can deliver. It would be easy for them to learn. The thing that excites me potentially of it being something that is good is that it's not just, quote, infant massage, and so it's, it's a technique that you can train parents to do, and it can be delivered over time, and it could be delivered, um, uh, you know, to older aged children, and potentially the children can, re can reciprocate that to the parents. And so it is something that, again, could be lifelong. And it is modifiable infant-driven technique starting at 30 weeks. And that was really our point is we wanted to see, you know, can we deliver something that's a little bit more than containment and provide positive um, touch and strokes because we know these babies are getting touched and manipulated and stuck and um, many things that are negative over time on a daily basis. And so for us to say, okay, well, we, you know, we're going to limit any stimulation but not um, provide something potentially positive, um, for me that was just something that was important. And um, implications for practice, again, um, the study builds on the science that touch is very important to pre very preterm infants. and um, and so we need to try to hopefully get across or go to the next step of not just always providing minimal stimulation, but potentially positive stimulation. And it's something that can be done in a relatively short period of time that doesn't require manipulation and kinesthetic activity um, of the, for the baby um, and could be something that the, both the caregiver as well as a parent could provide as well. And um, 
more importantly, healthcare professionals can teach these to parents and, again, could potentially have beneficial outcomes, not only for the babies, but uh, hopefully on the health um, and wellness of the parents and the mental health of the parents as well. So I do want to acknowledge that the support that we had for this, and I got a small grant um, from the uh, National Association of Neal Allen Nurses, Small Grants Award Program, St. Louis Children's Hospital Nursing Research Grant Program. I was also able to receive funding, and St. Louis Children's Hospital sabbatical provided me the time to actually not do my nurse practitioner shifts at the time, but actually be able to systematically test this. So I wholeheartedly um, thank them, all of them for their support in doing this. And again, for the families and staff who were went out of their way to support this program. I don't know about you, but I work in a, in a center that has multiple, multiple projects going on at the same time, research studies. And so it can be overwhelming, especially for the staff nurse at the bedside to say, okay, one more study, one more thing. But um, people were sincerely um, very supportive of this project and actually almost to the fact that it was kind of laughable. <laughs> They would track us down so that we could come back, and, and they wanted us to come back and do the technique, um, you know, on their baby to settle them down again. And, of course, we did it according to the protocol, but um, it was something that actually ended up being positive, and we weren't sure about that as well. And then Dr. Um, Bobby Pineda was actually the one that did our NNNS scoring for us, who was very well trained in that. And then, again, Jane Buckle. All, all the effort that she had in, in teaching us and supporting this as well. And then these were the major contributors I referred to earlier that we could not have done this study without them. And as you may or may not know, research is all about a team, and every single person was extremely important and valued for this project. Um, so actually, I just want to see if you have any questions. Uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to present this to you, and um, hopefully it was beneficial. Thanks so much, Joan and Sandy, for this. It was really, really good. You've had questions coming in through the whole presentation. So, Sandy, if you want to unmute yourself and come back on the line, and we will try to feed both of you uh, some questions. The so first one that I see came in was the M technique seven minutes long. Yeah, so the first time that we did it, um, again, we were learning how to do it. And you're going to um, deliver the technique based on the infant's response. The first time we did it, um, when we did the feasibility study, I think we were a little scared and wanted to make sure we did it right, but weren't in there too long. So we actually delivered it in five minutes. Once we, we, we became more familiar with it and um, wanted to be very systematic in its delivery, it ended up being a total of seven minutes. So anywhere from five to seven. But you guys, I'm also doing a lot of people interested in being part of the study. So we'll try to send these things to you, part of a, a multi-center study. So okay, got a lot of interest in the comment section. Thank you for everyone that did that. Um, someone so, else want um, to give her the next question? Oh, yeah. yeah so. Um, so a couple people asked, and I think people know you and your unit pretty famously for some of the effects on your your unique unit design and some of the studies you guys have done on development. So there was a question about looking at just those infants as separate groups, and did you guys consider that? It sounded like that you had equal numbers of your intervention babies in those groups. but Yeah, that's why you know, we have, wanted to pull that out, because that's a great question. And that's why we wanted to pull that out so that wasn't tangled in there because they just came off doing the study about the design and shown that there was a difference and not in the difference. So we did try to tease all of that out once we actually um, ran our data. So that should not have been a factor. Great. I thought, I thought this was amazing. I mean, obviously, um, my interest is, of course, um, in neonatal neurology as well. And so I was wondering, you know, do you see a place for maybe using some of the non-invasive brain monitoring in association with this to even further quantify some of that sleep and the deepness of that? Like, would you think about maybe applying mirrors since it's so 
easy to apply or, you know, of course, ACG yeah. would be awesome. I mean, did you have any discussion about that? But how, of course how did that we did. In? <laughs> so, um, so many of you might not know or know, as I said earlier, um, Terry Ender is part of our, our team at the time and um, now she is at Harvard. But, um, yeah, we had many discussions. And, of course, part of it is, you know, I also wanted to graduate. So that was one um, factor. But <laughs> Fair um, enough. But the other thing was, you know, and it even came, that's why it was, I mean, we were able to show you a video uh, on this, but this was not a baby that you saw that video. It was not as part of the study. We did this afterwards um, because even trying to get, you know, we didn't want to disrupt the environment at all. And so having the NEARS on, not knowing at the time really what the standard or gold standard of our NEARS, especially in that premature babies, would it be an issue for, um, you know, skin and, you know, would there be other things? So certainly it's something, I mean, my initial dream was that I was going to do MRIs and I was because we have all that, you know, and we were going to do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, um, to keep it manageable and simple, we wanted to see could we actually apply these because those are certainly interventions or measures that we could use to actually explore this further. That's awesome. So um, a question I had too and that other people are asking is what about the use of this, you know, I know you, you did the feasibility on preemies, but what about neonatal abstinence? Are other people looking at that or... You know, I, I think you're like you're saying it's obviously safe. So certainly there are thousands of applications. So what do you yeah, think about the neonatal think, abstinence I, group? I think the neonatal abstinence group would be great. I mean, that was a, a group also at the time that we thought, well, and again, we didn't want to have too many factors, and so we limited it to a certain population. But that is certainly a group that I think should be studied and looked at and applied to because I definitely think that they could potentially benefit. So um, somebody's asking about kind of dose effect or even suggestion. You know, would you do this twice a day, daily? You know, if you were just to implement it clinically without research, what you know, what do you think? Would you do it as often as you could? What What would you say, Sandy? I'm going to let. Um, yeah. So I I have an answer, but I don't want to take over everything. So I'll let well, you no, go ahead. that's that's fine. The um the I think the reason um. The application was done six times a week, so it was generally um, with the intent that um, a parent or a caregiver could do it once a day. So, um, you know, there isn't research on if it was done twice a day compared to once a day, but realistically, that was kind of why that number was um, picked, so that roughly it would be done on a once a day um, fashion. But I don't. And then, I, but in saying that, okay. I don't think we really do have a clear dose effect. So that mm -hmm. it, again would be something. And I would encourage people because you know, you know, doing full blown studies, randomized control trials is you know expensive, takes time, and they need to be done. They definitely need to be done. If people are going to try to do something, I mean, I just try to collect data, and so that we can just have more support of you know, are are they tolerating? Are they not tolerating? What is it about it that you know? And then, and then share that with others. Um, so I'm just throwing yeah. that out there. Yeah. So um, one of the questions I think dovetails nice with that is, how did you respond or modify the delivery if you did notice a baby showing any of those negative cues that Sandy kind of talked about in the beginning? So would, can you talk a little bit about if you did or didn't? Yep. So um, basically what we did was, again, like I said, um, really coordinated this well with either families when they were there and or the staff and the nurses and what they needed to do for the baby. So we, we usually started our day out, got there early in the morning and said, you know, when is going to be a good time for you? When can we help support this? And then if a family came, we gave them an option. You can, you know, they knew about the study already. And so we, you know, if you want to stay and watch, you're more than happy to stay and watch. If you want to you know, step out, you know, feel free to do so, um, so that we could have uninterrupted time. And then typically it was during the period, um, a time where the baby's starting to arouse. And so um, depending on their um, sensitivity to what was going on, we basically, you know, introduced ourselves like any of the uh, massage and touch studies do. You introduce yourself and then we would just um, place our hands in more of a containment-like 
um, posture and um, kind of wait till they settled in. And once we could tell that they were kind of done, you know, okay, what's going on? What you know? Then we would start. It was interesting over the overtime thing was interesting because once we started, they knew. They knew that they had felt this before. They had done this before, and they would settle. So the even though they were more alert and older when we would start, as time went on, they also had a quicker time to kind of come together and relax because they knew what to expect is just the best way I can describe it. And so if there was a period of time where somebody got fidgety or maybe um, they got almost too relaxed, then we would um, stop and pause. And typically that was not frequent at all. And then we would just go ahead and continue. So we never had to fully stop what we were doing. We would just uh, pause and wait to them. Um, to to allow us to continue, if that makes sense. Yeah, and just to add on to that, it um, just like Joan said, it would kind of initially, if you felt a little bit of a wiggle, you'd slow down first, and then um, just a couple times you might have had to just do a little containment and then go back. But most of the time, just slowing down a little bit. And typically, it was if you. Um, maybe sped up a little bit, you just slow down and that would um, calm them. There was another question I noticed about um, doing the back. The We had learned the adult strokes um, and then the baby strokes were a little different from the adult strokes. Um, but the, for the baby M technique, it was the arms, the legs, the back, and the face. And so for our study, we just did the back and, at this and the, intent, and the intent of that, and I know there was concerns about safe sleep, so I completely respect and honor and agree with that. The intent was that, was that we felt like if we could get central relaxation, it could help us promote whole body relaxation, and that was really where we went with that. And again, these are all babies that are monitored, that are studied over time, that we watch closely for. So we would basically get them to a point where they were, we would continue to monitor them minute by minute as for the study. And then once that was done, we would put them into a comfortable safe sleep position. There's a lot of just kind of general questions about the M technique, training availability. Um, is it a certification? Is it available in the U.S.? Some of those kind of logistical parts, especially, I guess, for people who are interested in partnering with you in future things. So can you talk a little bit about any of that? <laughs> so, um, so, so, we're, so we're working on that. Um, so basically, you know, we want this so that people – you know, can be able to use it. And so um, Jane Buckle was very gracious to, you know, teach us the protocol. Um, you know, she, like I said, she came here, she did train us. I have spoken with her um, on numerous occasions because um, she will be the first one to tell you she is not a, um, a baby expert. And when it comes to specifically the very preterm infant, we really felt that we um, modified that for that population. So, she, so if she gets calls, she will um, contact us because she considers us the expert in knowing for the very preterm infant. And so what we've decided here is that we're going to work hard. The biggest thing, you saw the, you saw the strokes, um, on some of the strokes that Sandy demonstrated in the video. Um, the biggest thing for us is really behavioral cues. I mean, we just, um, so there's two things. One is the actual pressure. The pressure, it, Jane spent a long time working with us on the amount of pressure, and so the pressure is very important. But also the reading of the cues. The you know I I don't want people to just be like oh yeah we can just jump out there and do because really I, anything else we do in the NICU, reading behavioral and physiologic cues is key to um, to what's going on with the baby. And so um, so we are putting together something that hopefully we can transcend this. So I don't want it to be like, oh, you can only do this if you've only gone through us, yet there still needs to be somewhat of a package so that people know 
um, how to deliver it appropriately. Um, so we're working on that still. Great. I think people will be excited to hear what's coming with that. Um, there's a quickie question about using any oil or lubrication in, you know, with this technique. What's the yeah. procedure? So the, the first time we did it for the feasibility only, just to see if, one, if the babies could tolerate it once, which was that first study I talked about. Um, I, you know, I didn't want to put in any other factors, so I didn't want to include, um, you know, oils because there's plenty of studies just on the oils themselves. So the initial time we did it, it worked okay, and we didn't use a lubricant. Um, doing it over multiple periods of time, we found that we really needed to. So the majority of our patients had Aquaphor at the bedside, so that's what we used. And there was an early question about gloves and that they have a hospital protocol about wearing gloves. Did you sometimes use gloves or did you never use gloves? Is that a contraindication or a no-no? I can't say it's a contraindication, but we did not use gloves. And I've done so it. I, I have done it since with using gloves, but then I've put a little bit of Aquaphor on just to so it doesn't, you know, the rubber against the skin doesn't stick or the latex. Yeah, I would think it would be a lot more difficult since that pressure is so important to really have that sense of, I mean, maybe really tight gloves, right? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. So just, again, lots of just thank yous here. Um, and I think just a couple housekeeping. If you weren't able to see the, the YouTube video, it will be in the email you receive immediately upon closing. And, of course, in our follow-up, um, Joan and, and Sandra are so gracious in giving us the approval to keep that up privately so that you guys can continue to have the benefit of seeing that video. Um, so we've posted it a few times in the chat area and as well. Um, I don't know if you two saw any other um, questions. I think we kind of got through them all. If you had an early question and we didn't, maybe retype it at the end now. There is a Another one here, did the infant remain prone after the completion of the massage? Our safe sleep standards would prevent that starting at 34 weeks. How did you manage this? Yeah, so that's what I re was referring to earlier, that um, again, we wanted to, you know, we went back and forth to discuss what was the best way as far as where to deliver this, because you could do all different parts of the body. And we felt that if we can get their central tone to relax, that we would get to full body relaxation. And so we went ahead and went with um, apply, uh, applying it to the back and saying that um, they were monitored over time and closely minute by minute um, and, and continuously to 10 minutes post. And then once we got through the study period data collection, then we were able to put the babies into the sleep state that they would, or into sleep um, that would be appropriate for um, back to sleep. Um, in the video, it appeared that the initial stroke pressure was not depressing the skin, and this increased to the level three pressure as described. Is that true? Well, it might have, uh, you know, we tried to do the level three the whole time, which is what, um, you know, the intent is, but um, that may have been the case if, you know, I, I haven't observed it very closely like that, but the intent was to keep the level three throughout. Great. And then someone else would like you to describe the three strokes again. Well, the first three strokes of the technique is starting at the top of the back, as you saw, and going downward along each side of the spine. And then it's like a backwards D coming back up to the top starting point. And we did three of those. And then the next one is a backwards B where you're coming down on each side of the spine and coming upward in a backwards B on each side. And then the third one is a diamond, where you start at the top, you come straight down on each side of the spine, and then coming back upwards in the shape of a diamond. So those were the three that you saw in the video. Great. Uh, last question, or close to the last. Did you say when in the when in the care schedule you were completing the massage, i.e. in 15 minutes prior to feeding or after feeding? 
Yeah, so we were very cautious about um, making sure that we didn't do it immediately prior to feeding, um, but then it wasn't during their rested sleep after feeding. So if they were on a Q3 hour schedule, typically I would be speaking with, the nurse. again, I spoke with the nurses on the basis when we got there that morning, but then I would come in and speak to them when it was closer to that time. So if they were, if they were um, scheduled to eat at nine, um, I would start going in at eight and seeing if whether or not it was we could, you know, they were showing signs of arousal, and if we could go ahead and, and get them um, started. And you may have answered this in a few different ways, but um, someone else wanted to know how providers adjusted to stress cues during, and again, the rationale for the strokes provided. So, first question is, how do you adjust to stress cues? And that was by just slowing down the stroke. If we felt a little wiggle or any kind of movement, we'd slow down the stroke, and that seemed to work. Um, if it didn't, then we'd stop it or even go to a containment if needed. Great. And then the second part of that question, I've now lost. Oh, what was the what was the the um, how did you how did you develop the strokes? Was that just part of what Dr. Buckle did initially, or did you adapt that at all to infants? Yes, so it was based, it was what Dr. Buckle had um, uh, started with, and then we adapted it to the population, our population. Great. I think, again, you know, people were so excited about this, a nice demonstration of interprofessional research, which I agree to, agree with. Um, so I think we've answered all the questions. You know, Sandy and Joan, this was really exciting to see a study kind of come to life like this and, again, be part of an interprofessional group. So thank you for sharing all that. Again, this webinar was brought to you by Dandelion Medical, and we are thrilled that we have experts like Sandy and Joan who are willing to be part of our webinar series. Um, I did want to let everyone know that Dandelion does have a line of organic skin care products, including a skin-to-skin -skin massage oil that is really healthy for baby skin. It has a wonderful glide for massage and absorbs easily with no harmful ingredients at all, so nothing that could ever enter the bloodstream or hurt the baby. Uh, there is a place in the evaluation form to note if you're interested in receiving a free sample of this oil or any information about the importance of organic skin care products for especially premature infants. Now next, if um, in order to receive your free continuing education credit, you're going to need to fill out the evaluation form, and there's a link that's in the chat bar right now or will be on the, the final page if you're listening to the recording. Uh, click, on the, click on the evaluation link, or once we're finished, you'll be immediately redirected to that evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you will receive a link to the CE certificate, which you will have to download and print. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you will receive an email within the next few days with a link to the evaluation, as well as a link to the recording, the PDF of the slides, and again, the link to the video that was embedded in the um, recording. If you're viewing as a group, you must, must each log into the evaluation form in order to get uh, the continuing education credit. We hope you will visit the Dandelion Medical website for future webinars and also links to the recordings of our previous 26 webinars that are all still active and available for continuing education credits. So have a great Labor Day weekend, everyone. For those of you that are not working, um, thank you all for listening and for your participation. And many, many thanks to Joan and Sandy for another fabulous Dandelion webinar. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy.